Hello and welcome to Go With The Heat. I'm Dominic. And I'm John. I'm Melissa. And this is your cultural guide to punch, chop, and kick your way through the greatest era of action movies. That is, of course, 1975 to 1995. This one, I'm going to tell you right now. I'm going to tell you before we even get to my final thoughts. This one, this one hit me harder than I <laughs> thought it was going to. We were in it for unlikely duos, and I was ready to go to Silly Town. And this movie, no Silly Town, even no. though you think it's got silly written all over it. No, no. it gets it's real serious right off the bat, too. No uh, lead into it. <laughs> <laughs> I do want to say that after watching this, I really feel like Bright, the Will Smith Netflix movie, completely ripped this off. Like, completely. <laughs> just completely ripped it off. They All they did was cross out aliens and wrote in orcs. <laughs> we are of course speaking of the 1988 classic alien nation which even though it got comic books it got a tv show it got multiple tv movies i still think they underdid the amount of content that they could have made from this storyline that mm-hmm. there's still lots of opportunities to make more alien nation stories but let's just, now that we're out of the 80s, we can make it better. <laughs> <laughs> we have CGI now. We can. We have the power to make it better. Yes. <laughs> Alienation originally premiered on October 7th, 1988. It is directed by Graham Baker. He's kind of a low-key guy. Doesn't do much. Directed The Omen 3, which has Sam Neill. What? Oh, like, me and Melissa got off on a huge tangent after seeing this. He directed a little oh film my God. called Born to Ride. With John Stamos as a <laughs> biker, as a, like a Harley biker that teaches a new military troop who rides horses to ride motorcycles and then eventually goes into battle with them. Like, think World War II or World War I or something. Can't tell by the by the you know, trailer. <laughs> <laughs> you know what's great is that I completely have gone my whole life just assuming that John Stamos did full house and then played with the beach boards a little bit, and that was it. Like, he never did any other things. No. <laughs> I looked at his film career. He has been in a bunch of stuff. A bunch of stuff. I mean, I can't even believe how much stuff he's been in, but he was also in a movie with Shamar Moore, and I'm going to find that movie, <laughs> and I'm going to watch the hell out of it. Because John Stamos and Shamar Moore together in a movie? I mean, it does not get more better looking than that. I don't think I want to know any other John Stamos than Uncle Jesse. I think that's uh, all I want to know about John Stamos. (laughs) Well, I can tell you, though, for as much as I'm in love with that movie and I and I wanted to see it, I quickly changed my mind because it also stars Joey Harden. And I'm not watching yes. anything with Joey Harden in it. <laughs> it had Joey Harden in it. Oh, yes. He ruins everything. He's Stupid awful. Joey. He ruins everything. <laughs> I want to make a quick mention for the producer on this movie, too. Her name's Gail Ann Hurd. She produced some of the classic, like the ultimate classic sci-fi movies, including Terminator, Aliens, and The Abyss. A lot of like 80s and yeah, 90s like- sci-fi. Gail and heard is the one producer behind those movies and also to add even more sci-fi chops to this movie it is written by rockney s bannon and i had a little note on this but i'm gonna get out of john's way because john's super sci-fi guy and if you are super sci-fi you know who rockney s o'bannon is even if you don't recognize the name he started out as a writer for the twilight zone he was also a writer for something a little something called sequest 2032 which if you've ever seen c lab on adult swim that's what they're making fun of that's what they're (laughs) making fun of bigger than that so like his writing on the twilight zone helped him get this gig for alien nation he went on and wrote a bunch of the tv movie stuff as well and that helped propel him to one of my favorite all-time tv shows farscape he created and produced farscape which is a cult sci-fi show that instead of trying to use early 2000s graphic they sought out the jim henson experience and they used jim henson with basically built them aliens and with movie magic and makeup and muppet and built the show out of that and it's one of the funnest shows ever i've always loved that they went with the muppets rather than trying with the fake cgi like everybody else it was a fantastic show and it also propelled Ben Browder and Claudia Black would go from that and get leading roles in Stargate SG-1, which would run for 
30 years, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> and then since Farscape, there's a Farscape comic, and there's a bunch of people who want to bring Farscape back, me included. They stopped making the TV show, but they started making the comic book, and there's a lot of fans of the comic book now. But beyond all of that, he's also behind some of my other favorite canceled shows, because he hasn't had quite as much luck over the last few years. You know the show, the sci-fi show Defiance? He mm -hmm. was a he produced that. He produced a show called V and a show called Revolution, which I enjoyed, which was about pa the electricity disappearing around the planet. He also produced Constantine, which was a part of that DC universe on WB, but that only lasted a season as well. There is rumor that there might be some TV-like episodes of Farscape coming back. I thought for sure you were going to mention Warehouse 13, too. He, he only kind of wrote one episode, and he was as much involved with that show i thought about it because i did watch a lot of warehouse 13 too so but um <laughs> defiance was really good that was part of that whole sci-fi just kept canceling stuff and that's where the writer and the producer and kind of the people who are behind the camera on this movie i think that helps with when you finish watching this movie alienation you can see that the people behind it had real sci-fi they're good at that they're good at sci-fi that's why this keep coming back even now even after all this time i still feel like it's probably pretty underappreciated for what it accomplished in 1988 even though it's had a bunch of spin-off stuff i said that it was the will smith movie bright was a ripoff of it but i mean there's elements of district nine you can't say neil blumkoff wasn't inspired by alienation when he made District 9, because it's basically the same idea. Aliens get stuck here, and they're not like the type of aliens you would expect. They're like slave aliens. I mean, it's all an allegory for illegal immigration, but we won't get into <laughs> I mean, yeah, that's exactly what it is. <laughs> and racism. Mm -hmm. like, mm -hmm. Just racism all over this movie. It's exactly yep. what it is. Before we get into breaking down this story, since we were talking about Rockney S. O'Bannon, now is a great time just to talk about the guest stars that are in this. In reality, when you look at the guest stars, you see who's behind the camera, and then you see who they picked to be on camera on screen. You're like, really? So that's yeah. true with, huh? <laughs> that that's who you picked okay what do you got john first the big guest star obviously is james Kahn, who plays matthew sykes james Kahn, pretty iconic actor it's funny he doesn't really consider this he almost talks about it like it's kind of a i needed the money kind of deal <laughs> he was born in the bronx to jewish parents his dad was a kosher busher he actually played football for michigan state he's a black belt in karate and he was a Regular on the rodeo circuit for a few years. <laughs> wow. Did he do wow. karate on the bulls? This is really gone. That's <laughs> I'm sorry, but this is really gone a place I did not. Hit. He is what Chuck Norris dreamed his character Walker, Texas Ranger, would be. <laughs> That's what James Conn is. That's yeah. Walker, Texas Ranger is about James Conn's life throughout, prior to acting. <laughs> It would be while well, his time at Hofstra that he would fall in love with acting. He would start out by doing some stage stuff. And then his first real big role would be El Dorado in 66 with John Wayne and Robert Duvall. And then he followed that up with the TV movie Brian's Song, where he plays Brian Piccolo. Brian Piccolo was the Bears running back who died. And the TV movie is a lot of the movie that men will admit to crying to. But also another big stepping stone in his career. Because that got him noticed to get the role as Sonny in The Godfather in 72. He'd follow that up with stuff like The Gambler, Thief, Rollerball. Which is just up there. I mean, totally. You know, Gambler, <laughs> Thief, Rollerball. All award winning. Yeah, that was quite a movie, that Rollerball. <laughs> Just shout out to Rollerball. In the 70s version, listen, this wasn't very good. We have a better version that's got LL Cool J. And Chris Pine. No, Chris. What was his Klein. Chris Klein. Chris Klein. Klein. Yeah. Yes. And yes. Rebecca Romaine Stamos. Rebecca, Rebecca Romaine <laughs> yeah. something uh, now. I don't know what her name Rebecca is now. Rebecca Romaine. And it yeah. ends up. It does end up being the better version. <laughs> How did it, go? it was like seriously deep, that movie. <laughs> he would actually take a break from acting for a number of years after his sister died of leukemia. Get kind of into a dark depression, a lot of drinking, a lot of drugs. He would have kind of a late comeback in the late 80s where he would show up in Dick Tracy and then Misery. And then as it, lately, he is probably most 
predominantly known in the 2000s for playing Big Ed the Line on Las Vegas. Melissa knows what I'm talking about there. Yep. Yep. So, I just didn't even think about that until right now. I'm like, oh, yeah, that is him. <laughs> yep, <laughs> that show yep, never so, got the ending we deserve. That it show, never did. I'm still disappointed at you. We never got the ending we all you. needed for that show. <laughs> you hear us, NBC? Yeah. We're still we waiting. Back. <laughs> we're still waiting. Tom Selleck, was, uh, did he die? Did yeah, the wedding what the happen? <laughs> what happened? It was a wedding cliffhanger episode. You can't end on you a wedding can't leave cliffhanger. It on, you can't end a season on that kind of crap. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, the last thing I want to throw out there is James Caan's son, Scott Caan, pretty accomplished actor himself. He was in Gone in 60 Seconds, Varsity Blues, the Ocean's Eleven movies, and then he's been a reoccurring role in Hawaii Five-0. So that brings us to our next guest star, Mandy Patikin. He plays San Francisco. By the way, the... The character's name was originally supposed to be George Jetson, but Hanna-Barbera said no. <laughs> wow. That's why. That's why he calls him George in the movie. It's kind of an <laughs> F you to Hannah saying, oh, yeah, we're going to call him George anyway. Yeah, so, they all have names like that. <laughs> Mandy Pankin, he was a good friend of Kelsey Grammer. He actually helped him get the role on Cheers. His first big role was The Princess Bride, in which he played Inigo Montoya. You didn't know that? Killed my <laughs> father. <laughs> same guy? Dominic that's the same was, guy. Dominic's Wait. face was priceless when he realized that that was the same. Yeah, I that's wish, the same guy? I wish we recorded this on That's the same guy. You, like, <laughs> you should have. You should have. It's him. No, no, listen. If that's the same guy, then the real Mandy Patikin died, and they put a body double <laughs> no, in his he's all, Yeah, he's also been in other things that you've seen, but yeah, that that's him. <laughs> so after Princess Bride, he would do a bunch of other kind of side roles, and then he would do this movie. And then immediately after this movie, he would do Dick Tracy with James Caan. He would play the character 88 Keys. After that, he would do mostly guest work before finding some traction on TV's Chicago Hope. He would play Dr. Jeffrey Geiger for 60 yep. episodes. I watch Chicago Hope. And then <laughs> Any kind of medical would, thing, you know I've watched it. <laughs> he would be Rube Sofer on Dead Like Me for 29 episodes, and then Jason Gideon on Criminal Minds for 47 episodes. That's yep. where I know him most. You know, it's funny, he left Criminal Minds because he didn't think it would be as gory as it was, and he wanted to do lighter projects. I watched an interview with him where he went into depth and detail like why he didn't like doing it, and he said like he didn't like being part of a show that he felt like they glorified children being murdered and women being tortured. Tortured. And he was like, I don't want to be a part of that. So I just, I tried to get out of it as fast as I could. <laughs> yeah. I realized so, what was going on. so he wanted to do lighter projects. So obviously he moved on and did 96 episodes of Homeland. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's right. That's him too. <laughs> As Saul Bernstein. Bernstein. <laughs> that brings us to Terrence Stamp. Terrence Stamp plays William Harcourt. It's weird sometimes. I'll read people's bios and it's like, they were a sex symbol in the 60s and were in all kinds of movies and this movie and that movie. And I'm like, I've never heard of these movies. And they dated all kinds of supermodels like this supermodel and this supermodel. Like, I don't know any of these supermodels. Like, oh, they're British. Oh, okay. <laughs> he was born in 1938 in Canal Road, Bow. Parents had to move shortly after because of German bombers during World War II. He would grow up to be an English-trained actor from Weber Douglas Academy of Dramatic Arts in London. Found a lot of early success in the 1960s. He was kind of a sex symbol during the swinging London scene. Like I said, he dated a bunch of supermodels and stuff. Actually took in, like Khan, took a hiatus after a bad breakup and ended up living in India for a number of years with mm. Guru before returning to acting. One of his bigger roles when he returned was General Zod in Superman. Oh, okay. And Superman 2. Mm -hmm. So, and then that's when he started doing more movies that like I recognize. Adjustment Bureau and Get Smart, The Art of the Steel. That brings us to Kevin Major Howard who played Rafter Man in Full Metal Jacket and Hawkins in Sudden Impact as as well as Stomper in Death Wish 2. I wanted to give him a nod. He's been in some of the uh, movies we like to watch. And then I also wanted to, to give a nod to Peter Jason, who plays Fedorcha. He was in movies like 48 Hours, They Live, Heartbreak Ridge, and uh, Escape from L.A. Okay, there's this weird nexus 
of like 40% of the things that I watch either on TV or movies, there's a person in there that spent time on Deadwood. Yes. Yeah. It's like some it's kind this, of convergent zone or something. <laughs> it's this weird prism to everything else in my life. Because we just Deadwood. watched somebody else who was in Deadwood last night, right? Yeah. No, it was the night gotcha. before we watched that Army of the Dead movie. Yeah. <laughs> oh, gotcha. Oh, I want to see that. Eh. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> not, okay. not quite okay. up. Not eh. quite up to the George Romero. I don't want to spoil it for anyone who has the like, not spoil it, but like set their expectations and be like, oh, I'm I'm going into it waiting to be disappointed. So, um, if you have seen it. Email us, goldtheheatatgmail.com. I'd love to talk about that movie. <laughs> I have lots of opinions about it. Here's controversial opinion number one about Army of the Dead. Dave Bautista, not bad. Yeah, he was oh. right. yeah, he was yeah. good. Yeah, he was good in it. <laughs> I thought he was good. All right. Well, there Surprise. we go. Surprise. <laughs> <laughs> Ar- Without- Army of the Dead, possibly better than Bright. Probably not better than District 9. <laughs> Sounds about right. That's about. I think that's what we're talking. That's, it's definitely, it's definitely better than Bright. So, I, and I've never seen that, and I don't you need to thief. see it to know. So, Will Smith, you thief. <laughs> well, on that bombshell, let's go break down alienation. <laughs> We have talked about movies that are similar to this. The movie was made in 1988, but. It takes place in 1991. It's, in the it's future. <laughs> it's so barely in the future that you can see it down down at the end of the road. <laughs> like they left way before you, but they're still like just like a few stoplights ahead of you. <laughs> you know what's amazing? We are only three years into the future, but they have made three other Rambo movies because we are up to Rambo Six. <laughs> Yes. So the two things I want to talk about when it comes to being slightly into the future is Rambo 6. That immediately stood out to me like, how do they make somebody Rambo so fast? <laughs> <laughs> how do they do that? <laughs> I mean, because, even if it's yeah, two, right? Two. Rocky, uh, like, Rambo uh, Rocky, 6, Rambo. Rambo 12. <laughs> <laughs> made it really fast. The second thing is that Ronald Reagan is still president. Yeah, what? Mm. And just a reminder, he served two terms. Yeah. And then George H. Or, yeah, George Herbert Walker Bush becomes president 1988 to 1992. So and he, then like, Clinton comes is back ni- again? How does Reagan serve a third term? Well, when aliens mm. show up at your, on your planet, everything goes out the window on terms. <laughs> <laughs> the rules don't apply. Yeah, rules don't apply. They're like, we need him to be president forever because we have aliens on our planet now. I don't know. I didn't even think about that. <laughs> I just couldn't get over the Reagan thing. Because you see Reagan in the beginning, and then he comes back up again later. And I'm like, why is Reagan president? Because they were they were very lazy about this, and it was not in the future. It was <laughs> actually filmed in 1988. <laughs> and so they were like, listen, we don't want to predict anything. Thing. so let's just let's just film it like it didn't happen in the future that's true because the reagan speech that they used we talked about the aliens is some other really famous yes. speech that we all recognize so lazy yeah. they should have made like some random guy president that's better than i don't like it when they use i don't know but i don't know maybe i'm not i mean i'm the only one that thinks this but i don't like when they use actual presidents in movies because then you're like this is really far-fetched like i know i know mm-hmm. when obama gave that speech okay and it wasn't for when aliens landed <laughs> Yes. Yeah. I know when Bill Clinton gave that speech and it was not for whatever, like they're going to b- blow something up or well, it so, it's so dumb, especially when it's supposed to be the future, because it's like <laughs> this is supposed to be someone who's supposed to be elected later, like not just like, like, hey, we just dug up some random presidential footage from this year. He was <laughs> he, he was in Berlin. Hey, yeah, get that footage. <laughs> it's lazy. It's very mm-hmm. lazy. <laughs> Now I'm starting to wonder if they just covered up like Rambo 2 with a number 6. <laughs> <laughs> that is blasphemy. <laughs> I just love the movies where they're set slightly into the future and then the people try to imagine what the slightly into the future the will slight be. future looks like. Two Rambo movies, huh? Th- three, that, three that Rambo. was what you like that, dreamed up? up with. Yeah, that's the- <laughs> yeah because well, it could be like flying cars or, you know, because it's like, well, that's too crazy because we, we are not even anywhere near that. Or like Jetsons type, like where they they eat their food in a pill or, you know, like that's, whoa, that's mm-hmm. crazy. Seashells to wipe your butt? Maybe we can do that. 
<laughs> <laughs> that might be a thing. We might need that. <laughs> and what gets me too is it's like immediately in the opening scene, they make a point to show you the Rambo 6. See, we're in the future, guys. But then they make no effort throughout the rest of the movie to make anything remotely, like not even a paper with the wrong date on it. Like... <laughs> Yeah, They're literally in- driving like a 1985 Buick Park Avenue. Yeah, nothing is in. I was gonna say that right now. Nothing is in the future, other than like there's there's Rambo Six and whatever. Nothing. None of the cars and their clothes. Not they don't have like phones in their car. They don't have anything that screams like, oh, this is futuristic. It's all like, no, this was made in 1988. <laughs> all these cars yes. were built in 1988. You can tell in the stock footage that they use when the aliens come. They're showing the news to show yes. when the aliens come. It's all these country yokels out in the desert <laughs> yeah. <laughs> getting out of their cars <laughs> looking at the alien spaceship. For three years, they've had an alien spaceship and nothing. No new breakthroughs. No fancy futuristic technology. Like, come on. Like, yeah, no I ray mean, guns. Yeah. <laughs> Do they, do they not let the aliens create anything? Like the can't they, the aliens well, create a spaceship? Can't they create they are a spaceship and fly aliens. away? <laughs> <laughs> we immediately get down to business with the racism because we go to the bar. <laughs> they keep talking about how the aliens are strong, they're smart, they're hardworking. We find out later in the movie that they were bred for manual labor. Some mm-hmm. other race made these aliens for manual labor. They come to earth and they get put in the exact same scenario they're just allowed to have some more autonomy than what they've had in in other places but they still live the demeaning life because the people at the bar are throwing stuff at the bartender and talking down to him so they're all just working these low pay menial jobs and and then the hard work the back-breaking labor as we find out later that they spend most of the time in most of them work in that methane plant because they don't get hurt from it. But I don't understand mm. because they said a lot about them, how like they're really strong and they're they're bred for like manual labor. But then when they were interviewing people, when they're talking about the aliens, like in the news, they were saying one of the people was saying like, well, they're so smart. They learn everything so fast. What is my kid supposed to do? He can't compete with that in school that they yeah. learn so fast. Their brain's was- not like a human brain. It's like, OK, but what is it? Are they are they dumb laborers? <laughs> like, who are it, strong it's, it's or are they really weird. smart? <laughs> It's weird. It's like no other issue we've ever talked about where people blame them for taking their jobs yeah. and mm. being here <laughs> illegally, but they usually get stuck with all the crap jobs. I don't yeah. know. I mean, it's but like they're a bunch of criminals, obviously. Like we immediately <laughs> see them committing a crime. Bunch of <laughs> damn illegal aliens. Wait a minute. <laughs> In Slagtown, that's where you're going with we meet Tug and Sykes for the first time. They're driving around talking about the slags i don't feel comfortable using that term (laughs) i'm sorry that's a very insensitive term (laughs) it's a vile term all right okay newcomers thank you thank you they're driving through slag town to look (laughs) at the new (laughs) (laughs) we all know what that stands for yes we all know know what that is supposed to mean some other word that starts with an s Uh uh-huh so let's just not (laughs) Uh uh-huh there's drunks on the street hookers the best part about the drunks thing is that they get drunk on the spoiled milk and that's that's <laughs> yeah. like that's legit like that's my clever. favorite part in this that's movie clever. Like the- <laughs> that's clever that's yeah not just that but their whole diet the spoiled milk and then eating the raw beaver <laughs> i'm sorry but how is that sustainable how many beavers are there i don't know i've considered <laughs> eating a few beavers in my time <laughs> The best part about this <laughs> open where they're driving around town complaining about the newcomers. Well, just one of them is complaining. And then <laughs> Sykes is telling Tug, I don't talk to my daughter. I'm not going to go to her wedding. I've been divorced. Wait a minute. Let me get this straight, Sykes. These, yeah. newcomers, These are the newcomers are the problem. Yeah, exactly. You, dirtbag, yeah. not a problem. Yeah, he's a dirtbag. Uh-huh. He doesn't talk to his daughter. She's getting married on Sunday. She's All she wants is for him to be there. And Tug's like, you got to go. We're going to go. Me and my wife are going to go. We, and he's like, I can't believe you're going to go because all because his ex-wife's husband is paying for the wedding. Oh, because you're a deadbeat and you can't pay for it. So <laughs> who is he? Charles this, Bronson? <laughs> this sounds like your typical Sonny and Tubbs. Wait a minute. Hey, you better not be trying to say that Sonny is like. <laughs> Just a little like Sykes. I'm not. I mean, <laughs> uh, no. <laughs> 
Tug and Sykes stumble on a robbery, what looks like a robbery that's happening at this mini mart. So they go to very slowly break it up, by the way. They, well, they're doing a lot of surveillance. They don't know if they, what they should do. They're trying to get, they called back up already, so they're just kind of waiting. So that's why they're going so slow. So they're like behind a car, watching from far away through the convenience store window, trying and, to be tucked away. And it turns into a shootout. And what's hilarious about the shootout is that his partner is hiding behind a pole like a cartoon and yet somehow not being hit and yet somehow he's able to escape and get behind a car that partner kind of moves in the way for him and that's when he gets hit he should have stayed behind the pole he was doing pretty good back there i couldn't figure out that what that was the only thing about that like i know i know this is bad but i know that it's supposed to be like a sad scene because he's gonna you know he's getting he's getting shot at and he's gonna get shot but when he started to fire through that car like the first couple of shots why didn't he just run why did he continue to go behind it like it was like some kind of comedy like lay flat yeah, or something or something <laughs> else yeah. right. Right. I'm getting my ass back to that pole. (laughs) 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 I know it's not supposed to be funny. It's supposed to be like, it's supposed to be a serious moment, but (laughs) it's not that serious because a, like it's talking about, they shoot through the car and he doesn't try to escape. And then B, Sykes comes over and sees him like, oh, shucks. Ah, yeah. <laughs> oh, shucks. Yeah, no. Like, no emotion. Oh, like, crap. <laughs> then Sykes starts to try and run down the perpetrators. And I swear to God, he is having a hell of a time running in those heels. <laughs> I, I have noticed that that's just the way that James Conn runs. Have you ever you noticed any yeah. other things? He runs like that. Does all he the time. wear? Does he wear like cowboy boots or something? Is there wearing, a reason like, he runs like that? <laughs> <laughs> Looks like he's wearing high heels. But you know what it is? He runs on his like his heels. So his it's like his heel goes down first, and his toes are pointed up. <laughs> <laughs> The slowest foot chase in movie history occurs. <laughs> like he's not even trying. We do see two things here, though, is that A, the newcomers have different weapons. Wherever they got those bullets from, be able to shoot oh, yeah, all the way through a car. Yeah, it was like an ele- right? they called it like an elephant bullet or something. There, Yeah. And they have this drug, which obviously the rest of the movie is about this drug that they use. And it's not just about makes them feel good, but it's like PCP and steroids and coke all rolled into yeah, one. Yeah, it makes them like invincible. They can't be taken down. Yeah, they call it bath salts. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, that too, but... <laughs> after Sykes finally takes down the other newcomer after the newcomer takes the drug, the police come, they pull up like right then, too, and they're kind of like, oh yeah, it happens. Sometimes these newcomers are way hard to take down. Okay, have a good day. No, remember, he get, he takes down one, but then another one attacks him from behind. Oh, yes. So he's like fighting for his life. He's fighting for his life. And then that one, he never really sees him from behind. He's like strangling him, lifting him off the ground, like squeezing him after he took down the newcomer who took all the drugs. And then the police start coming. He hears, so the alien hears the sirens. So he basically like leaves James Conn out of breath and like knocked out almost. And then he comes to, and then when he comes the to, first... the person who's helping him up is a newcomer, but yes. in a police uniform. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you're right. Sorry, I kind of glossed over that. Yeah. And so that's when you first see him like reacts angry toward him because he's associating with his partner's death and so it seemed very weird to me that a couple scenes later that he would want to volunteer to be that same alien cop's partner because of course the very next day that patrol cop gets promoted to detective third grade he's gonna use the newcomer cop so that he can get into and speak with other newcomers right that's his plan all Mm -hmm. along yeah and yeah. he tells Sam Francisco from the very beginning, that's what he's using it for. Like, I'm just using you. Yeah. Because, don't talk to me. Don't do anything to me. I'm just using you. Yeah. Because Francisco is like, thank you so much. Because no one will work with him because he's a newcomer and everyone's really racist and prejudiced against the newcomers and they don't want him there already. And it's this pet program of the mayor to have this him be promoted. It's great for community outreach and stuff like that. But San Francisco thinks that he's doing it to be nice and like he's reaching out. And so he's like, he gets some donuts and coffee and stuff. And then come to find out, he's like, no, I don't really want to work with you. I'm just using you to get what I want. So don't, we're not going to be friends. And by the way, I'm not going to call you San Francisco because that's a ridiculous name. So I'm going to call you George. Which? George Jetson. <laughs> Suck it, Hannah. <laughs> Side note on that, and I don't know if this was the intention of the writer and director, but that's a common thing for minority groups. 
where you have a very ethnic name mm -hmm. that's very hard for English speakers to say. Yes. And then they say, well, I'm not going to call you that. It's too hard for me to say. And they make up some other name to call them. I mean, that's what they did to people coming over, right? In Ellis Island. They mm -hmm. were like, well, you're never going to be able to use that name. So, I'm gonna, But you're also right, like at work. You yes. be like, my name is, yeah. you know, like something very ethnic. And they're like, I'm not going to call you that. That's too crazy. I can't even pronounce that. You're you're going to be Sam from now on. My dad's name is Alfonso. And he never went by that. Because when he went to school, there was not very many. He's Hispanic. And there was not very many Hispanics in school. Mm -hmm. He was one of like two or three in his high school. So instead of being different, he always went by Al because he didn't want to be. Well, that's the example that I'm talking about is that there would be other mm -hmm. people who say, my name is Alfonso. They're like, nah, I don't like Alfonso. That's a very ethnic name. I'm just going to call you Al. Yeah. Like, well, my name's actually Alfonso. His name was never Alfonso after that. It was always just Al. He wouldn't, you know, it's not something he would do. Like, no, mm -hmm. people didn't. He worked with them for 20 years and they didn't know his name was Alfonso. <laughs> <laughs> Well, little do you guys know, but in my native tongue, Sykes means shithead. So. <laughs> and they all, all the aliens know it. <laughs> Mandy Vatican does a really good job at this point in the movie. You feel like he's your dad. You got this, Sam. Yeah. You can yeah. do this thing. He's, he's got the donuts and the coffee. He's not that good of a shot, but you know, he's going to get better. He means well. He can make the joke. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right? You call yeah. him a shithead. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Meanwhile, Sykes so wrapped up and give me the biggest gun you've got, this Magnum 44 with a scope on it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. By the way, the future looked very much like 1988. <laughs> Just completely. <laughs> Not like Harley Davidson and the Marlboro Man, in which the near future was so cool because everyone just lived at the airport. <laughs> and had black trench coats that were yeah. like bulletproof. There was nothing bulletproof. And by the way, they still had Winchell's Donuts in, 19, <laughs> in the future. <laughs> okay, so Sykes and Francisco are supposed to be working a different case. They're supposed to be working the, not the Mini Mart case. But the, uh, the Hudley the, or the Hubley. Hubley case. Hubley, yeah. It's, which is another newcomer that was murdered. They found him dead. Yes. And they think, they don't know if they thought maybe it was like a robbery or like a, like he was robbed on the street. But instead, Sykes says, we should investigate this mini Mart murder and we should go to the morgue and go see the bodies, go talk to them to find out what they know, what the doctors know. Because there's about a connection the between the two. Because I think be. they're going to be connected. And Francisco's looking at Sykes. He's like, but those are not our case. That's, that's not, our, not case. our case. Yeah. But of course, Sykes wins in this moment. They go down to the morgue. More people in the morgue being unnecessarily short and racist against the newcomers. Yeah. Which is kind of strange. But has a newcomer assistant. Francisco goes straight to the newcomer. Like, yeah, whatever. I'm gonna talk to this guy. Yeah, and they start talking about like what kind of levels did he have? Him and him. And the two newcomers are speaking in their native language and he's telling him like give me the test results don't tell anybody else what the test results show just give it to me for whatever this this level thing is but the irony of it is that the guy who works for the morgue not treating them like they're human or not treating them like they're people right because he's like isn't it crazy when you open them up they look like this and i don't know how to say because they're not people but not treating them very humanely what the hell <laughs> if you want to hang around and watch me cut one open like it's pretty cool <laughs> yeah it's not yeah and they're, they're like maybe if you work at the morgue you're like desensitized to that but it was very much racist because he's like oh you know they're kind of crazy because they have all this weird organs that go this way and that and they can do this and this with their body and stuff. It's like, okay, but they're still, like, dead. They're just, like... <laughs> what, what I thought was funny is that it's filmed in a very cop show, like how they go to the morgue, looking at the files, and just being blatantly racist in front of his assistant and just talking about cutting them open and calling them slags and just... Sykes is the one that's going to go down to the methane plant because we know that Hubley and somehow now this mini mart murder the people who committed the murder one of the people one of the robbers would also work there too one of the robbers he actually shot but you could tell by the boots yep they paint their boots when they work in there sykes is going to go down to the refinery to go talk to the people down there and then san francisco is going to go talk to the widow the one who witnessed the murder at the mini mart Sykes goes down, talk to the methane plant because Hubley worked there, and then also by chance, one of the murderers also worked there. Everyone liked Hubley. The manager recognizes one of the other people in the photo, but hey, no one's called in sick or anything. No one showed up to work. We have nothing to report here. And then after Sykes leaves, behaves like a cartoon villain. Well, Sykes is like gonna go into this one area. Where it's like these two double doors. And he's like, no, 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 no. You can't go in there. 
the fumes and they're the only ones these slags are the only ones that can do this job you can't go in there it'll kill you you have to wear like a suit and you're not it's off limit you can't go in there then he acts really suspicious after Sykes leaves, as in, like, I'm going to go in there right now without a mask on. <laughs> so something's just in there. We just don't want you to see it. But <laughs> Real fast, Francisco talks to the widow. She doesn't recognize any of the people in the photo, but says her son might. Then the next day, we get a glimpse at Francisco's house with his wife and his kid. He's living the American dream. Single mm-hmm. family house. And his wife is there with their kid. And they're playing in the front yard. And you can tell Sykes is really jealous of it. Because he's not a dirtbag like Sykes. So. <laughs> it turns out when you're not a dirtbag, you get a nice wife and a kid who loves you <laughs> and wants to say hi. And also, when he comes home, San Francisco's so excited to see his family. He's like, that's my family. He waves and stuff. Not like you, dirtbag. <laughs> <laughs> so they stop off for a quick bite of beaver and milk. <laughs> Well, real fast before that. Before the beaver and milk. <laughs> what they decided to do is they're going to go see Harcourt because he's an associate of Hubley's. Harcourt's getting an award from the mayor. I mean, I think this is poor timing to go get him, but okay. <laughs> <laughs> him and his partner, Rudyard Kipling. <laughs> <laughs> I forgot about that. <laughs> are too busy to be able to answer any questions. Come by my office. Sykes and Francisco leave. Harcourt turns to Kipling and says, you need to go murder this dude. <laughs> we need to get this done. Have you talked to Stadler or what is his name? Stadler. Stadler. Mm-hmm. Have you convinced Stadler to go along? And Kipling's like, no, I can't get him to. He won't do it. And he's like, well, you know what you need to do. Sorry to get the name. <laughs> <laughs> need to offer him more beaver. <laughs> Give him a fresh slap of beaver. (laughs) And then Sykes and Francisco decide to double down on a section of beaver together. (laughs) No. (laughs) (laughs) Then they're going to go to the bar and go talk to the son of the widow. Sykes has this brilliant plan. He's just going to run in there. It's, it's It's a newcomer bar clearly he's gonna <laughs> yell a bunch of racist stuff at the newcomers accuse the wrong person <laughs> of being the person they want to talk to then have the goal to tell francisco to shut up he's got this under control yeah so he goes in there he starts yelling the guy's name i try to remember his name i don't remember the son's name he starts yelling it out and then he's like i think he's at the end of the bar george <laughs> san francisco's like i think he's at the end of the bar he goes down there he's like i think you have the wrong person the person over here <laughs> The, the son stands up and he's gigantic. And so he starts berating him and basically telling him, like, you're going to talk to us no matter what. And then when he when he says he's not going to, he decides to kick him in the groin, the son in the groin, only to discover that that doesn't work on newcomers. <laughs> and then he also he, finds out that his mother mates out of season. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. He's like, what did he say? Your mother mates out of season. <laughs> <laughs> San Francisco does not want to say that. He's like, no, I can't say that. <laughs> she mates in the fall. Who does that? <laughs> <laughs> That's the curious thing, because later in the movie, he gets hit on by one of the aliens, and she really wants to get down with him. And I keep thinking, I wonder what it's like. I wonder where it goes. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's true. If the males don't have, like, the same anatomy. But, okay, let, let's be honest, though. She had the same anatomy as a regular yeah, woman. Yeah. She had breasts. And- <laughs> That's the interesting thing about the newcomers in this movie. They're like, not being that inventive. Luckily, newcomers can wear the same clothes. Yeah. They could just go to Kmart. And remember, we forgot a key scene where they go to get the dead guy's stuff. And inside it is a condom. Remember? Oh, and yeah. then It's not one of the newcomers. That, it must be somebody else's condom. There was the other guy that was the driver. Yeah. And so they go get the mm. stuff. And just goes like, what is this? And Sykes is explaining to him what it is. And he goes, and it fits. <laughs> so they have a penis. <laughs> and it's gigantic. <laughs> yes. So that's what I'm saying. Where does it come out? Like, does it come out from, does it come out like from under their armpit? Or, because that's where he tells them to punch him later. He tells them to punch him under the armpit. Oh, yeah, he says under the arm. Oh, my God, they two double penises under their arm. Double penises. We have double penises. Then why would she even be slightly interested in humans? (laughs) Sorry, I just think it's funny that I was the only one that remembered that part where they had a huge penis. (laughs) I was like, they got a huge penis. They're like, he's like, it fits? Like, pulls it out. He's like, I still don't get it. He puts his whole hand inside of it. He's like, nah, this would never fit me, basically. (laughs) Remember, because the secretary is a a human and she's very interested in what's going on. (laughs) We find out more about the newcomers, too, because we get the scene with them 
They've got Stadler, I believe. Next I'm, to- I'm looking at it now. It's Strader. 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 They took him to the beach, which sounds nice. <laughs> It sounds nice until we find out (laughs) that the same as hydrochloric acid on us is water to them. Salt water, specifically, Mm. not just regular water. Salt water. Which is a curious case to live in L.A. But anyway. (laughs) Yes. I digress. Kansas. Kansas is the place for you. (laughs) Utah feels safer. (laughs) So they can't go near it like at all. They they start to bubble as (laughs) I'm I know. He looks like a piece of cabbage that's been boiling too long. Sykes and Francisco go to the club. That's where we have the scene where the... the uh, like lounge singer. Cassandra, they try to talk to Schrader. He's gone. So they found out from the son that Schrader owns this club across town. You should go talk to him there. But they also found out from the son that Strader and Hubley. Him, Hubley and his dad were all in some kind of business deal together with somebody else. But he doesn't know who the other person is, I think, or something. Strader's not there. Cassandra's, hey, but I get paid to do stuff. So you want to do some stuff? But she didn't want to get paid. She was just like, hey, let's just do it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, she, she just no wanted money. to bone a human. Yeah, that's she what didn't I'm saying. For money. <laughs> and he was very interested in it. As much as he was like, well, no, I got to go, though. I'm investigating this. But Sykes says, listen, I don't have time for this right now. <laughs> yeah. Well, well, right now. We'll come back yeah. around on this. <laughs> I may be back. <laughs> Then we have the so. great, this is a great scene. It's so loving and touching. And They become Sam, best pals. Best exactly. friends forever. I want to be best friends with San Francisco. Yeah, he's they such sit a around nice guy. And get drunk. He's drinking the milk. Sykes is drinking vodka, I think, is what, yeah. is what he's got. They're getting mm-hmm. drunk together, telling stories, they're telling jokes. He tells Find jokes like our the- dad. <laughs> Francisco gets drunk. <laughs> <laughs> they get so hammered and everything that the next day, this dude stops and breaks into the car and he starts hooking up this churro. <laughs> uh, it's more of a series of churros. <laughs> <laughs> then they're going to blow up, but yes. <laughs> yeah, but then Sam wakes up because he must smell the churro because they're delicious. <laughs> and he scares them off. I think that's what's going he, on. Because he was so wasted. He was so sour milk wasted <laughs> that he couldn't drive home. And his wife's going to be pissed, he says, too. Oh, yeah. you know, too- he's actually not a dirtbag. So he goes home to his wife normally. <laughs> <laughs> Just a few too many lumps. He's going to be in the beaver house tonight. He's not <laughs> He's not sleeping with his wife tonight. <laughs> and that bonding moment, this bonding moment that they have, even though they foil the bomb being planted on his car, translates to when they have to go to the beach. And Sam is not happy with having to go to the beach to look at Strader yet. <laughs> Just one more thing about the bomb, too. My favorite part of that scene is he comes walking in the house all hung over, and he just hands it to him. Like, here, hold this. <laughs> <laughs> He's like, just hands him a freaking bomb. <laughs> Sykes goes down to the beach, sees the other two guys who are actually doing the investigation on Tug's murder. The ones who are supposed to be doing it, even though Sykes and Francisco the ones that made any headway on it. He goes down to talk to them. The body's melted, obviously, because it was put, put into acid. They're making all kinds of jokes. They spray painted on Sykes' like car. car. Yeah. In the interim, when he went down to go look at the body, they decided that then they were going to spray paint on his car. Something like Slag Lover or something. I don't remember what it was. What's oh, it? yeah. And they don't normally carry around paint. So someone had to drive to the store, <laughs> buy spray paint, and come back. Yeah. The, I guess the main thing is that these guys are just douchebags. You know? Yeah. They're jerks. Like, And they're not even good at, hey, I'm kind of a gruff cop, but I'm good at my job kind of jerk. No, they're just jerks. They don't, they're not yeah. good at their job, well, and they're not good at anything. So <laughs> We finally start to see a little bit of James Caan becoming best friends forever with Sam because he decides to uh, stand up for him and smashes one of the guys' head up onto a uh, steering wheel. HR's going to hear about that one. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, he, he defends Sam, even when Sam isn't there. Yeah, because Sam's up. They're making fun of Sam because they're like, look at him. He's such a baby. He won't even like come down here to look at the water. He's like, why would you? It, it's like acid to him. He, he would, mm-hmm. he could die. Of course, he's not going to come near it. And then they're like, oh yeah, like just making fun of him and like, oh, you're falling in love with him, huh? And like, well, he is. No, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they shared sour milk together. So, <laughs> and then they're off to the morgue, where it always creeps me out when you see morticians eating while they're in the morgue. I know, you yeah. Know? I mean, they're so rude. They just interrupt them. They didn't even let him finish eating his beaver. <laughs> 
It's the future, guys. Beaver's the new cow. <laughs> Francisco, here's some news. Won't tell it to Sykes. They get in the elevator. Sykes corners him. What is going on? That's when we find out that there's this drug that their race, it was used on their race when they were forced labor for whoever was to create them. And it's this drug, this highly addictive drug that makes them feel good. And the harder they worked, the more they would get, which is obviously the cycle. Yep. Because then they're super addicted to it. And they'll just keep showing up because they want that drug. They'll keep working harder. And the owners will hold that over them to be able to force them to do whatever they want. It's a dark chapter. They want to eliminate that on Earth. That drug is not going to exist anymore on Earth. And that's why San Francisco is so torn over it. He can't, beside himself, he can't believe that someone's actually got it here. They're race is so addicted to it it's got to go they can't have it around well it's like it, apparently it's also deadly to them because he said his best friend got addicted to it like when they were slaves together his best friend got addicted to it and he like i don't know if he died or what i don't know what i totally get what they're going for is their whole race was held hostage by this addiction but later in the movie we are informed that the chemical is actually not illegal in the country and it basically boils down the laundry detergent so they're basically taking Taking Tide, Tide pods? pods. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, oh like, I, yeah, I mean, they stopped the drug from hitting the streets, but guys, guess what? They're going to be in pod form soon. <laughs> it is the future. The, the future's going to get worse. <laughs> yeah, it's not a controlled substance because no one knows about it well, yeah, because it doesn't do anything to humans so whatever it is humans could probably take it and they would it wouldn't affect them like it does the aliens so of course now sykes and sf they need help george <laughs> they need help they need someone who can use a computer and so they go find a woman <laughs> that can look up things in the computer for them how things have changed right it's 1991. We're slightly into the future. Men still unable to use the computer. Of course, they got to go to the secretary <laughs> or, or Miami Vice case, <laughs> Trudy. <laughs> yes. I was going mean, to say, like, they had to go get Trudy. Yeah. So that they could figure yeah, things exactly. out. <laughs> The funny part is, is what they're telling her to enter in is just names. They're like, okay, try this one. She's like, okay. <laughs> like, I mean, I think you just moved over. Or you could just like type in the name yourself, but okay. There's a keyboard here. No, no, no. Put in Steve. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's <laughs> magic. Like, okay. <laughs> they're able to conclude that Schrader, Hubley, and the third person, which I'm drawing a blank on his name, uh, Porter, they're all in cahoots. We find out from... They're like the, their investigation. And then we also they, find out that in quarantine, mm -hmm. they were all in the same bunk. Because obviously, yeah. when you come from space, you need to be quarantined. That way, you don't get space germs all over the place, mm -hmm. which apparently we can pull that off, but not keep people home from COVID. But I mean, this is the future. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> at no point during the investigation, we're like, I wonder if these people were roommates at any point, you know? <laughs> yeah, because San Francisco talks about how he was in with the uh um, orders son son so then they figure out that they were all in the same bunk and there was a fourth person because there's four people in the bunk and who's the fourth person harcourt i don't know where kipling was but <laughs> <laughs> pretty far into the movie at this point we haven't had a car chase guys i'm starting to think it's not actually a cop movie <laughs> i mean it's not like tango and cash where it starts out with one they go down to the refinery next step what's going on down at the refinery they see the man. The manager is walking out <laughs> with a sandwich. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> sees him. Goes, oh snap! I better run into the drug room, <laughs> the place I don't want them to investigate. I better run in there with no mask on. Also, where it's like supposed to be poisonous, but it's not. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, and Sam basically grabs him while he's running in, and basically opens the door with his face. So yeah, Sam's a little all, bit feisty. Yeah, he goes Sam's all a little rage. feisty. <laughs> George goes nuts. He goes in there, smashes everything, just off the rails, nuts. Tell me that the stuff that they were using to make this drug did not look like the little guys in Fraggle Rock when they were building them. <laughs> <laughs> Remember the cities where they build them and they look like those like glass pieces? That's what it looked like. I'm like, yeah. he's smashing up Fraggle. <laughs> What's little guy's called? I don't know. I'll have to look it up. Hold on. I'm going to look it up while we talk. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> then they want to know, okay, where's the drugs? Because now that I see what you're making, 
I know what's happening. Where do they take the stash that they made? And the manager says they took it earlier that day to a club called en- Encounters, which is Schrader's Bar. So that's where they're going to go next to go break up this deal with Harcourt. Fraggle Rock, the Dozers. There we go, ah, the Dozers. Yeah. The Dozers, they build those little cities. So we're off to Encounters and pretty much the last scene of the movie. So it's all going to take place in this area. First, we see that Harcourt's going to do this deal. He's going to sell the drug to these other people. They're actually able to manufacture it. He was bunked with a person who was a chemist that knew how to make it. Apparently, they don't need much because that quantity was more than enough for what the buyer was looking for. If it is mostly laundry detergent, you can pretty much buy that anywhere. <laughs> Francisco walks in and says he's got the bomb that was supposed to be planted on his car. He uses Harcourt to murder. That's when Trust. Harcourt tries to say... You can't arrest me for drugs. This isn't a controlled substance. Like, yeah, but I can arrest you for murdering all these other people. And she, so. and then he says, you, you murdered whatever, Strader. I can't forget that guy's name. Yeah, right? Strader. Strader. And then that's when Cassandra goes crazy. Shredder. <laughs> <laughs> you killed Tubbs and Shredder. <laughs> She goes crazy and tries to, like, pull out a gun or something. And is that what she does? She tries to pull out a gun, doesn't she? Mm -hmm. She just stupidly ruins everything. (laughs) I'm just kidding. (laughs) SF gets punched in the newcomer nads. Goes down. (laughs) (laughs) Gigantic dicks. Gigantic dicks are down. (laughs) They're down, okay? When you have giant dicks, it hurts even worse when you get hit. Where are the armpits? (laughs) Think how bad your small balls hurt when they get hit. Now imagine if they were giant. (laughs) No one said anything about balls, okay? (laughs) That was never a thing. (laughs) So you say it's just a big dong, no no berries? (laughs) That's what I think. Now that we've talked about this, like what could be in in their armpits? Gigantic dicks in their armpits? When he gets hit in his armpits and he goes down, it makes more sense. I know. (laughs) That's how I'm saying. Right in the egg sack. <laughs> Makes so much more sense that if you hit them there, they just go down in a in a pile. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> their stomachs hurt. All three of them. <laughs> Sykes saves SF from Kipling because he's got that gigantic gun. He, sorry, he punches Kipling in in, in the big dick too. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> After Kipling kills a cop, by the way. Then they chase after Harcourt, which is heading down towards the ocean. Obviously, Francisco is getting a little nervous here because he's uh... running along the pier. (laughs) Here, the car chase is heading down to the ocean. The car wrecks. He has to pull Francisco out. He moves him out of the way. He's hurt real bad. Kipling's stuck in the car. Looks like he's going to make it up, but then the car explodes. Psych follows Harcourt down. Harcourt's at a dead end. He can't jump in the water to be able to escape, so he's stuck. He's just gonna roid out. Yeah, so he just takes the drug. Just takes all of the Tide Pods, ODs, and dies. And that's the end of the movie. And they go back <laughs> to the Buick Park Avenue, and they're all just kind of hanging out. Everything, you know. They're making um, jokes and, like, talking about how his son told a funny joke, and they're like, oh, I've heard that one, too. He's like, stop me if you've heard it. And it's like, I've heard it. Stop. It's not funny. <laughs> so then he happens to mention that he took all of the Tide Pods, and it turns out these guys don't OD. They turn into a beautiful butterfly. <laughs> <laughs> or they turn into a cannibal <laughs> they eat uh, the t- internal organs a, a giant <laughs> cauliflower monster <laughs> he's like a mix between the predator and frankenstein right i kind of got predator meets vampire vibe he's kind of got a kind of a nosferatu kind of pale i yeah. would say it's more like a zombie the way he eats them is like gross <laughs> and disgusting and like a vampire would just eat your blood right this guy, like, rips their stomachs open and eats, like, every part of their body. <laughs> yeah, so apparently if you OD on this stuff, beaver is no longer enough. Nope. <laughs> Obviously, they have to go and find and kill the giant cauliflower monster. So, <laughs> James Conn still runs like he's wearing high heels. Don't put those toes down. Just keep running on those heels. <laughs> They're doing the search. So, they've got Sam is on one side of the police car. Sex is on the other side of the police car. And then the police cop, whose name we don't know because he's not going to live long enough to care. I think his name's like Sullivan. Because they're like, Sullivan! Sullivan! <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, he sees him. So, he guns it with the car and completely leaves them in the dust. And then... 
they when they get up there, he's all dead. And it's like, what what are you doing, Sullivan? <laughs> what are you doing <laughs> being all dead? <laughs> you're, well no, you're like you're in the car because you're you're not helpful. Yeah. <laughs> like they you don't want you to die. <laughs> yes. You're just supposed to drive behind them with the light. Yes. <laughs> You know James Caan can't run that fast. <laughs> <laughs> you know, sometimes you got, like, the gout just flares up. Yeah, I can you know, stay in for a couple days. <laughs> of course, Sykes is the one that finds Harcourt. A little bit of a battle. Tries shooting him. He's just a bullet magnet. Won't go down. Harcourt is. Then Sykes runs. He knows he's not going to survive if Harcourt catches him. But little sneaky bugger. Runs and jumps onto a boat and then jumps from the boat to a dinghy yes. as the boat's going out into the water. So now Harcourt's stuck. I think he thinks at first, like, oh, he's not going to follow me. And so then he's like, well, he's following me. Shit. <laughs> I gotta <Yeah>. go. <laughs> For Sorry. once, Sykes has a brilliant plan that gets him into the dinghy and it just tackles him into the water. But yeah. he's losing, though. <laughs> well, so Sonny's got him in the water. I mean, Sykes. <laughs> Sykes. No, so he's got him in the water and it, it's burning him but it's like the monster he turned into is still like too tough still fighting with him even though the guy's melting in his arms so which has got to be weird it's got to be like 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 hugging like a giant melting ice cream i imagine it was like if he was fighting a, like a meatloaf or a corned beef corned beef is probably <laughs> yeah. more apt like that's gotta be like something something kind of salt salty and briny oh, but like gross. still the juicy Comes off in oh. flakes and like strips. <laughs> Ultimately, he dissolves like a bouillon cube, and then Sykes starts to drown. And it turns out those police helicopters do not have life jackets or any kind of rope or anything. Nope, they're very unprepared. And so, <laughs> all Sam George can do is wrap his hand with an oven mitt he found on the <laughs> helicopter. Yes, yes, this is what it looked like. It was like a shirt or something. <laughs> Helicopter pilot's wearing a scarf, which I guess is good. Jaunty. <laughs> yeah. Jaunty for L.A. I mean, see, he's going to go home and go, see, he laughed me about that scarf. It came in handy today. <laughs> he's got to reach into the water and burn his hand to save sight. I have a question about that scene. So, and I know it's like a big deal and, and Francisco's going to stick his hand in the water, but I have a question about that scene. And mm. Salt water is like sulfuric acid to... The newcomers. Mm -hmm. So question is, if, if you were hovering over a pool of sulfuric acid, would the drops and mist of the water from the helicopter also burn you? That was my thought, too. Yeah, like, he should have been burned be all like... over, not just his hand. Should have been burning mm -hmm. them like crazy, right? Because if you, yeah, for us, for example, if we were to be near a pool yeah. of hydrochloric acid and there was a big fan blowing mist in the yeah, air, that would be a be problem like, yeah, for us, yeah, right? Because the yes, water guy yeah. was spraying him in the face, right? Mm -hmm. So yeah, so George should probably be uh, probably dead. So well, we're gonna look past look that. Look like a cauliflower monster. <laughs> <laughs> we're gonna look past that because it's important for us so that George is here for next week's episode in which we go to Sykes wedding, but there's a murder and there's a <laughs> no whole another caper to, to, to solve. I swear. <laughs> well see what's gonna happen is is that Sykes is gonna get amnesia. Oh, get out of here. It's not being he's gonna <laughs> stop being Sykes, he's gonna go by bikes. I get out of here. <laughs> <laughs> But the most important thing is, Sykes doesn't give no crap about tub, a tug. No. Tug is Tubs. the dead. See, I got you doing care. it. I got you doing <laughs> yeah, it Yeah, I know. I'm going to say tub, yeah. No, he stopped caring about tug. I mean, the minute he found out about I mean, he they got a new partner. Even... He was like, "Well, Tug's dead. I guess I gotta move on." He he didn't even go to Tug's funeral. We never I mean, saw that funeral scene. The we the wedding was on Saturday. It was this Sunday. took place it was on in like Sunday. Three days. Yeah, four days. Insane. So. All that time, and he didn't even mourn his friend, who mm -hmm. he's known since before his daughter was born. Yes, mm. but it's okay because Sam Francisco took his place at the wedding, so it's okay. Yeah, what? Yeah. He just filled in for him. <laughs> hey, he, he, now him and Sam, he's got a new best friend. His best friend is now Sam, who he likes to call George, and they're going to be <laughs> best friends forever. It'll all end because Sykes will have an affair with, with Francisco's <laughs> wife. He's going to be really disappointed. <laughs> you only have one and it's small oh. oh i just love the recurring joke since we started doing the movies podcast penises? it's all about big dicks <laughs> we're still waiting Dolph. come on <laughs> how do you rank against san francisco we want to know like hey what is the ranking here and that's the alienation i have 
<laughs> more thoughts. I have lots of thoughts about this movie. I know we poked fun at it throughout <laughs> our breakdown, but I have some deeper thoughts about Alien Nation. This movie hits hard. Is it the Beavers? <laughs> <laughs> It's what the big dicks do with the beavers. That's what has me really concerned. Uh, the best episodes are the ones full of innuendo. <laughs> this movie, it's really good. It's really good. And I wasn't prepared for that. I was prepared for cheesy 80s sci-fi. Right, and mm-hmm. this movie ended up being really deep, so I'm, I'm gonna save more of that. But I think we're gonna have a different opinion. <laughs> save it for that. Let's save it though. <laughs> well, before we get there, let's go break down the music. Sorry, I didn't. I can't even think of music that's in this. I'm having a hard time. <laughs> well, just wait, cause it's gonna get better. All right, John. As Melissa said, there's music in this movie. I was so locked into the story, wasn't really paying attention to, to what was happening with the music. What do you got for us this week? So it has actually got some really good music in it to the point where it was hard to kind of pinpoint one thing to focus on because it was such a star-studded music lineup. And to make it worse, there were some really big songs that were covered by other really big bands. So we're going to do this as kind of a quick hitter. We're not going to focus on any one specific one for too long. We're going to throw some quick stuff out about each one. That way we don't spend too much time talking about any one specific band. Which I know, surprising, because like you didn't even realize there was music. But let me start I'm, it off. I'm remembering now, that's right, there's all these scenes where it's got these big yeah. songs, but they're cover songs. So... It starts out with You Really Got a Hold on Me by Smokey Robinson, born William Smokey Robinson Jr. He's an R&B Motown legend and the fr- former frontman for the Miracles. And something quick about him is his favorite uncle Claude actually gave him the nickname Smokey. He used to take him to cowboy movies when he was a kid and him and his uncle came up with cowboy names. His name was Smokey Joe. He told people his name was Smokey Joe until about 12 which he dropped the Joe and just became Smokey Robinson. Our next song is Surf and Safari by the Beach Boys. Beach Boys are made up by Brian Wilson, Dennis Wilson, and Carl Wilson, who are all brothers, their cousin Mike Love, and their friend Al Jardine. Their 1966 11th studio album Pet Sounds is largely considered to be among the most influential albums in music history, and they're one of the most commercially successful bands in history, selling well over 100 million records. So what gets me with the Beach Boys all the time is that I remember the surfing stuff from the Beach Boys. I, you don't think about their whole collection. Pet Sounds, that album, gets always listed on like top 10 greatest albums of all time. They did some really experimental stuff there. And so the Beach Boys really were the America's Beatles. Yeah, that's true, I guess. I guess I never thought about it that way because they did do a bunch of experimental stuff. Yeah, so like after they had the like poppy hits, they did a bunch of experimental stuff throughout their later years, which they all got strung out on either drugs or alcohol. So I mean, they're pretty much the Beatles. Our next song is Sitting on the Dock of the Bay, written by Otis Redding. But performed by Michael Bolton. It was actually It was actually released on Michael Bolton's 87 album, The Hunger. But nobody gives a shit about Michael Bolton. So Otis (laughs) wrote the song with guitarist Steve Cropper while vacationing on a houseboat in Sausalito, California's Waldo Point. Uh, They recorded it twice, but it was still considered to be unfinished when Otis died in the plane crash. After his death, Cropper talked them into adding seagulls and the wave sounds post-death because that's what Otis wanted Mm. uh, for the song. And it's largely contested who actually does the whistling part, but Cropper insists that it was Redding who did the whistling part. There's one of the covers. The other cover... Sympathy for the Devil, written by Mick Jagger and Keith Richards of Rolling Stones, and that was performed by Jane's Addiction. What? So, and that's actually when they go to the club scene before the lounge singer starts hitting on him. She's up on stage to Sympathy for the Devil by Jane's Addiction. So wait, two things. Two things about this. One, it was kind of a weird song for that scene, and I, I get where they're trying to come from. It's kind of a weird song. But two, 
Jane's Addiction was around in 1988. Oh yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. How long oh, yeah. were they no, around before been a- that? They've been around so a long Jane's, time. Jane's Addiction actually broke up in like 91 originally. So like they were like the first of the alternative grunge bands. They're made up of Perry Farrell, Stephen Perkins, Dave Navarro, and Eric Avery, who was replaced by Chris Chaney. They were formed in the late 80s when Farrell was original band broke up. Him and Perkins left and formed Jane's Addiction. The name Jane's Addiction comes from their housemate and self-proclaimed muse, Jane Banter, who they lived with. The original suggestion was Jane's heroin experience, but they thought that was a little too on the nose. (laughs) So they made it a little bit more vague with Jane's Addiction. So what happened with Jane's Addiction is that they released like three albums really quick, and then they broke up because Farrell and uh, I believe it was Farrell and Perkins were deep into drugs, whereas Avery and Navarro weren't. And they were like, like, like guys, like I, we don't want to do this. We don't want to. We don't want to be around you guys anymore. So everyone split up and started doing side projects. Dave Navarro joined the Red Hot Chili Peppers in like 1993. Farrell and Perkins would go on to start Porno for Pyros, which is a, just a great, great band. So, but that moves us to our next song, "Scary Monsters" by the great David Bowie. So you guys see why I couldn't just focus on one person? Otis Redding, <laughs> David Bowie. I thought um, we had James Addiction. Bowie from Music Forever. <laughs> I thought so. So the only thing I will tell you is that he's born David Robert Jones, which is also the name of the bad guy in the first couple seasons of Fringe, which I thought was great. <laughs> Oh, yeah. (laughs) Um, He also had 11 number one albums, also sold 100 million worldwide, and starred as Jareth, the villainous Goblin King, in the cult film Labyrinth in 1986. He also was in the cult film The Man Who Fell From Earth in 1976, in which he admits that he did way too much cocaine and didn't really know what was going on. (laughs) That brings us to our... Last band and song, Indestructible by the Four Tops. They were a vocal quartet from Detroit when Motown exploded during the 60s. They were founded as the Four Ames. Actually remained a group, guys, for four decades. From 1953 to 1997, they toured and performed and continued to make music. Damn, I didn't realize it was that late in the 90s. Yeah. And what's even more incredible, or I guess I guess one chance of fate, is that in December 1988, they were supposed to fly home on Pan Am Flight 103. That flight is also known as a disaster called the Lockerbie Bombing, mm. which they were supposed to return on that flight, but they had a performance on the Tops of Pop show and overslept. Well, that flight ended up, a terrorist bomb ended up detonating and crashing in Scotland. So, yeah, they ended up uh, escaping one because Tops of Pops kept them out late at night. So, wow, yeah. crazy. And so there's your music, there's your quick hitters. Obviously, I mean, Tops of Pops, David Bowie, Jane's Addiction, Otis Redding, Smokey Robinson. I mean, pick your poison. I could have talked about any one of them, but there, that gives you a little bit about everybody except Michael Bolton, who can fuck off. <laughs> I'm I'm glad. I'm so glad we're on the same page. (laughs) (laughs) All right. I totally forgot all the music because of it does fit with the movie because of everyone's names, too. So it's supposed to be like pop culture. Yeah. Infused Mm. with in there, which is interesting because it's supposed to take place in the future. Anyways, (laughs) (laughs) let's go give our final thoughts on this movie because it sounds like we're not all going to be on the same page. Let's go give our final thoughts. Okay, before Melissa gets a chance to be able to speak, I'm going to chime in here with my final thoughts. (laughs) I've been kind of hinting at them throughout the whole random. I really did like this movie. I had seen it. But as a kid, some one thing that's going to be in common, and anyone who's listening to this, 100%, your dad also loved this movie. My dad did. <laughs> Everyone's dad <laughs> loves this movie. <laughs> Saw it that way, kid. Watch it now. Like, wow, this is really deep. This hits on a lot of socioeconomic race stuff that was happening that's still happening especially in la and just do a really good job of saying things without saying them it's not really hidden it's still at the surface it walks like a duck and quacks like a duck yeah but it's Mm -hmm. you you come to the conclusion if it's a duck that's basically (laughs) what, what happens here right and i think they do a really good job and i think what 
seals it, though, is Mandy Patikin. He does a really good job. And it's weird with the aliens because they're so human-like that it's hard to, to, to think of them as being non-human because they, they wear the same clothes, they're the same shape. They eat the same, roughly the same food, right? Mm -hmm. They're basically humans. But Mandy Patikin does a really good job, and he really makes this movie because everything else is kind of meh. But Mandy Patikin really makes this, and that's why I'm hooked on it. His really good job of passing along and making you feel like what where he's coming from. James Caan does a good job because he's supposed to be an asshole, and he does a good job of being an asshole. <laughs> <And that's... laughs> um, but I, I think we should figure out where he's not an asshole. <laughs> <laughs> so i think the two together it works the duo works out and that's why they become friends at the end it just moves too fast there's some there's some story problems but mandy Vatican is the one that really makes this and i really liked this movie and i really liked him and i really like the story they're telling so melissa what are your thoughts on this i agree that that one of them is fantastic at his role and <laughs> <I'm just kidding. laughs> james Conn is i'm sorry i know this might be an unpopular opinion but i don't think james Conn is anything He's the same character every time he plays something. Tell me how he's different from playing that role as to being the dad and elf. The dad and elf, he's a huge dirt wad <laughs> who treats his family <laughs> like crap, alienates him, and then they don't want to be with him as until until like they finally Christmas magic happens and then he realizes what a jerk he's been. So like, yeah, he's good at that. He's good at that role at being a jerk. My problem with the movie is that it's not silly. There's no silliness. It's an alien movie. There's not enough like crazy alien stuff. They just kind of look like snake. Like they have funny shaped heads and they're spotted. Okay, gotcha. It's not going to be silly. <laughs> it's going to be serious. It's serious, but they don't take a stand on anything. It's a movie where they don't have a point. Great. You t you are showing us what it's like for racism, but there's no like, hey, we should really be not doing this. At no point is there any, like a big like moral statement made about how like being racist against whoever this is supposed to be about, fill in the blank for whoever you think it's about, about why it's bad. And no one ever learns a lesson except for Sykes. You know, he changes his mind and they become friends. And it's a good, it is about friendship. I will say that. It is a good movie about friendship. And But you're right. There isn't some other bigger no. cultural change. Only Sykes is the one that changes yeah, his Sykes mind. Yeah, Sykes is the one. They are still, at the end of the movie, the best, the most pivotal thing at the end of the movie is that where are, where is San Francisco or San Francisco and his family sitting? They're sitting all the way at the back of the wedding. And the, no one's near them either. No one's near them because no one wants to sit next to them. They're still just a bunch of racist jerkwads through the whole movie. <laughs> <laughs> so, yes, I mean, I get it. If it was, if, I would be okay if it was like, hey, you know what? We're going to be really silly. They're going to bust out of these big eggs and like, you know, what I'm talking about like, sci I don't like, I'm not a sci-fi person. Like I'll admit that well, right now, but, but there's not can, even that. I, so there's not can, even any funny things. Can, can I read you a quote from James Caan about the movie? So when asked about <laughs> alienation in 1988 during an interview with the AV club, this is his response. James Caan said, why the fuck? Why would you bring that up? <laughs> yeah, well, I don't know. I don't know. I, I don't have too many. I mean, I loved Manny Patikin. Mandy was a riot, but I don't know. It was a lot of silly stuff creatively, and we had this English director who I wasn't really that fond of. I mean, nice guy, but it was... <laughs> Just one of those things where, you know, you don't quit. You just get through it. It certainly wasn't <laughs> one of... I wouldn't write it down as one of my favorite movies, but it was pretty popular. Yeah, I mean, I think that really less, like sums up the whole movie. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that, I mean, I think, I think, I think that James Punk kind of wrote love... that about the way I'm talking about the movie. So, like, listen, I... it's... It, I, I'm listening to your response and I'm thinking about that quote. And I'm like, that was the same quote that is basically what James Conn <laughs> said to the he AV was club. It. <laughs> yeah, I mean, just a movie. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Did it have 100% had a lot of potential to be a groundbreaking movie about racism and, and all of that? But did it do any of that? No. Was it funny? No. Was it zany? No. Except for dicks and, and their <laughs> armpits. <laughs> and that they eat beavers. You know, I guess I just have to come to the conclusion that now that I've been a dad for so long, I just got to be into dad stuff. <laughs> Maybe that's why you like it. Because <laughs> you're a dad. It's a dad movie. So, anyways, John, 
what are your final thoughts on this movie? Okay, so as a big sci-fi guy, I will say that I love this movie because of what came from this movie. Obviously, Farscape and some of the other stuff and other people that bounced through. Also, all of the Alienation spinoff stuff. What I'll say is that a lot of times, it seems like we pick these random movies. And one thing that I really enjoy is that there's a lot more influence behind all of these movies, even if it's just stuff that's as silly as this person ended up getting this role in this other movie. Like I was saying earlier, you can see parts of Alien Nation in like a bunch of other sci-fi movies. I specifically pointed out District 9 because it has the same kind of setup where the aliens kind of showed up. They're stuck here. It's actually a pretty big movie in, as far as science fiction goes because it gets pulled from a lot. And then like I was giving crap to the, about that Will Smith Bright movie, which is basically him having to take on the first orc partner and being a bastard to him the whole movie, which is essentially what this movie is basically about. And then you subtract, you just change drugs to magic wand, and that's Bright. <laughs> <laughs> it's still getting ripped off today. It's still influencing sci-fi projects today. It's such a good movie compared to a lot of the sci-fi we could have chosen from 1988. So Enemy I mind. would definitely I would definitely put Alienation above Harley Davidson and the Marlboro Man, being that they're put even though they're both set slightly in the future. I encourage you to go out and check out Farscape just for the Jim Henson experience stuff and the way they filmed it and everything. I really just want to say, fuck you, Michael Bolton. <laughs> fuck you and the horse you rode in on. And that's going to go for us this week on Go With The Heat. <laughs> we hope you enjoyed this episode. We would love to hear from you, unless your name is Michael Bolton. Or Chuck Norris, either. Yeah. <laughs> you can we, really us. we really burned those bridges, didn't we? <laughs> <laughs> you can email us, go with the heat at gmail.com. You go to the website, go with the heat.com. You can find all the ways to contact us. I want to say a special thank you to the people who sent us money. We've had some people that have sent us some PayPal. When we talked about making more ex this podcast more accessible we're using that money to be able to make it more accessible use the money yes. that was sent to us by our canadian friends to Thank pay so for the much. transcription service yep pays for the transcription service and the tacos <laughs> <laughs> and also just a little if you're thinking about it too you have to like hey you know what? there's some people that gave them money donated money for them to be able to pay for the transcription service i might do the same so i'll let you know there's no limit down what you can give <laughs> oh yeah it doesn't have to be $10. You want to give us 1000 10000 PayPal won't stop you. you if you got into your account, you can give us like 100000 No one will say – I'm not going to say anything. <laughs> you want to give a million? We'll take it. Yeah. I mean, yeah. We'll take it for sure. Whatever's the cap on, on PayPal or, or Square, like in, in Patreon, hey, there's only one way to find out what the max is on Patreon. You just go in there and put in the max and keep putting money in there until it tells you to stop. But if you don't have any money, which you understand there's people that don't have any money. You can also send other... us food. <laughs> there are we accept food. Ways. Now, we haven't received any catalytic converters yet. We know the post office is slow right now. So this is still a chance. <laughs> still Some a chance catalytic converters could, could show up. Listen, the be best time is to do it at night. And do it in neighborhoods so they don't normally yes. have to deal with that kind of stuff. <laughs> so they... <laughs> just, but just the, just the converter part. We don't need the header. We don't need... The muffler, just the catalytic converter section. That's easier to ship. All right. If you're not into stealing, breaking into people's cars <laughs> in the middle of the night, you can also share the show. Let other people know about the show. That'll help us a bunch. You can write us a review on your podcast, your platform of choice. Give us five stars. And then tell in there what the best method is for stealing catalytic converters. <laughs> Go into detail. Let everyone know this is how you do it. You can find these kinds of cars. It can't be a car low to the ground. Can't get anything. You gotta look for those crossovers. They're kind of high <laughs> off the ground. Leave your review in your podcast, your platform of choice, whatever you want it to be. I mean, if it's about stealing catalytic converters, let me know. Email me. Go to gmail.com. I want to see that review. That's gonna do it for us this week. We hope you enjoyed this episode, and we'll see y'all next time. Bye, pals.